The church is an unusual thing. It's something that has the hand of God upon it. It's a place where the Word of God comes from. It offers altars where we can come and lift our requests before God and make our sacrifices to God, all in this place called the church. It's a place where God's people can come and be encouraged. It's a place where God's people can come to edify one another and encourage one another, all in this place called the church. You find in this given location, we find that it is the temple that is being dedicated. I want to look into chapter 6 just for an instant at how Solomon began to dedicate this place and notice what the church is all about. I notice in verse 8 that he says, it says, But the Lord said to David, my father, Solomon doing the talking, he said, For as much as it was in thine heart to build a house, Got this phrase, for my name, thou didst well, and that it was in thine heart. We find right off the bat that the temple, and such should be the case, the church as well, it's not the name of the pastor, but it's to be the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And if we would be a body of people that would understand that his name is attached to it, it would help us to live more rightly when we go out into the world. Because when somebody looks and says, that's a member of that church, and we know God's name is either being uplifted with our lives or being, sadly enough, taken down in, uh, in the eyes of the people with our lives, it would help us to live more true to God because the church is about the name of God. I notice as well as Solomon continued preaching, he said in verse 10, he said, excuse me, in verse 11, he said, and in it I have put the ark. Now let me pause here and let's understand the ark, what is it about. The ark was symbolic of the presence of God. And so not only is the place of God, the temple in this case, but the house of God now, not only does it have God's name attached to it, it's to be a place for the, micro, for the microphone, I looked over at my wife and saw her saying, turn your microphone on, and it's a place there. Got the microphone on now. Thank you so much. All right, so uh, the house of God is a place for microphones. No, no, no. Um, the house of God is a place for the presence of God. So we see. Now I better back up, just be sure I'm back on the beam here. The house of God's a place where God's name is attached, and the house of God is a place where the presence of God should be exemplified. Now the presence of God is here, there's not a doubt about it, but if we're not careful, when we walk in these doors, if we don't come in right with God, we can walk in and somehow grieve the Holy Spirit. Let me give you a for instance. Have you ever had a spouse get upset at you? And they're there, but they sit over there and they don't say anything and it's as if they're not there? Well, absolutely so. Sin is an offense against a holy God. And so when we come to church, we don't come for the, we should not come merely to see our friends, although that's a good reason. But we should come primarily to see God. And so may we come to the house of God right with Him. So the name of God, the presence of God, I look into verse, into verse 12, and notice he said, and he stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the congregation of Israel. And that last phrase says this, and spread forth his hands. Now I'm not going to spend time dealing with what does the hands represent and all of this. I'll tell you this, you'll find the answer to the hands being lifted in Leviticus chapter 4 and verse 8. No, no, Lamentations chapter 4 and verse 8 where it talks about when we lift our hands, we're lifting our heart before God. But what's really going on in this hand lifting? We're worshiping God. So the house of God is a place where God's name is attached. The house of God is a place where we can sense the presence of God. The house of God is a place where we worship our Lord. That's why we've sung these hymns. That's why we've, we've had some time of testimony in Sunday school and things are going on of this nature. All about worshiping the true God. The house of God. 
as well notice in verse 14. The scripture says it again that he spread forth his hands in verse 13. Verse 14 says, And said, O Lord God of Israel, there is no God like thee in heaven nor in the earth which keepeth covenant and showest mercy unto thy servants that walk before thee. Boy, what a statement that is, with all their hearts. Okay, so we see there's a worshiping going on. You saw that in verse 12 and 13. But verse 14 bleeds into praising. Worshiping is about God. It's about Him. It's just about who He is. He's the Almighty. He's the Wonderful. He's the Counselor. He's the, the Mighty God. And that's worship. It's all about just Him for what He is. But praise is about what He does and our experiencing of it. We heard some of this morning in, in Sunday school, some of the things that's gone on with God's people, how that God has blessed us, and we heard that this morning, and different blessings on how God has shown to us individually that would be praise, and that's what, so, that's what Solomon was doing in verse 14. He was talking about how God keeps his covenant, how God's been merciful to us, and he was praising God. So the house of God is a place where God's name is attached. And for 60 years, this church has been a place that has had the name of Jesus Christ attached to it. We find that this is a place, this, this, the house of God is a place of the presence of God. And yet again, 60 years, this church has been in existence that if North Highlands wanted to know what God is like, they could wander into this place to sense the presence of God. We find that the opportunity to worship God in church, and yet again for 60 years, you've had a place, your doors have been open, a place where people could come and worship the true God. God. And really, in all reality, that's the main reason of our existence. Right. Revelation 4.11 says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory, honor, and power. For Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. And then as well, this place has been here for 60 years to offer praise and worship to our God. Boy, isn't that wonderful? And to think you're a part of it. To think that you are a part of something as marvelous as this. Now we back back up into chapter 5. In chapter 5, we note that this temple is here. Well, maybe I'm still laying a little bit of a groundwork, so I'm not quite ready to get to chapter 5. In this, we find that this tabernacle has had some... The, some this temple has had some, some ups and downs in getting it finally built. Do you remember who wanted to build it first? David. Do you remember who built it? Solomon. Why didn't David build it? Because if you'll remember, there was a day David was on a rooftop when he should have been out in battle. When he was on that rooftop, he spied a, a woman and committed the sin of adultery. Then he committed the sin of murder, killed her husband. Then he committed the sin of lying to the nation of Israel. And God said to David, because of this sin, he said, the sword shall not depart out of thine house. I state this, that this thing that we think so little about as a nation today called sin, God thinks very I'm not talking about high in, 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 uh, in, in honoring it. I'm talking about he puts a supreme watch upon the sins of mankind. And all we see here is David as now he's a man of the sword. And then there came a day that David had this burning desire within him to build this temple. And God said, no, a man of the sword will not be the one that builds my house. I think to myself, David probably said how I wish I would never have committed sin those years back in my past. That sin that now I've got a burning desire to do something for God and I cannot do that which I long to do because I just succumb to sin. 
That sin that our, we, our, our youth are growing up and being bombarded with, and if they are not careful, they will commit sins in their youth that will disqualify them in God's service in some areas that they may burn to do something. But David, what did he do? Did he go find a palm tree, sit under its shade and sulk and say, I can't serve God because I can't build the temple? And the answer is no. David said, if I can't do that, I'm going to do the next best thing I can do. He said, I'm going to lay preparation so my son can do it. Look over in 1 Chronicles chapter 22. In 1 Chronicles chapter 22, I come to verse 3. We're in the midst in our church of family month. And I encourage families... I strongly encourage families to lead your family down the path. Men, lead your family toward God. Notice what David did here. 2 Chronicles 22, verse 3. And David prepared iron in abundance for the nails, for the doors of the gate, and for the joinings, and brass in abundance without weight. Also cedar trees in abundance for the Zidonians, and they of Tyre brought much cedar wood to David. And David said, keep in mind, this is all about the temple, and David said, Solomon, my son, is young and tender. The house that is to be builded for the Lord must be exceeding magnificent, of fame and of glory through all countries. I will therefore now make preparation for it. So David prepared abundantly for his death. David was, was not going to have the privilege to build the temple. He longed to build it. But sin in his past had kept him from being the one that God would use to build this temple. But David didn't sit down and sulk. He said, if I can't build it, I want to lay the groundwork for something that my boy will do for God down after I'm dead and gone. And, so, and David began to lay the preparations. I encourage dads today that you've got children that are following you. Lay the foundation that will point your children into a path of serving God. God's graced us with parents, with children and, and, and that are Christians. We that are Christians, he has graced us with these children. Our job is to train our children for the ministry of our Lord and Savior. He didn't give us our children to raise good educated children, though they need education. He didn't give us our children to raise good sports figures. Nothing wrong with sports unless it takes the place of God. That he gave us our children and us as parents are, are, are required of God to equip our children with what it takes to be able to serve our Lord down through their lives. And David was preparing and preparing his son for such a case. Preparation. Look over in 2 Chronicles chapter 12. In 2 Chronicles chapter 12, we see the lack of preparation in verse 4 that took place in 2 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles chapter 12, verse 14. The scripture says, and he did evil. Talking about King Rehoboam. He did evil. Why? Because he prepared not his heart to seek the Lord. We find that a lack of preparation, growing up, saying, ah, sports, I'd rather do sports, I'd rather do my video games, I'd rather deal with my social medias than deal with the things of God. Just, just a squandering of our youth's time rather than bothering to prepare and lay the foundation that can be used down through life in serving God. Look in 2 Chronicles chapter 27. 2 Chronicles chapter 27, I come to verse 6. This is about uh, Jotham. So Jotham became mighty because he prepared his ways before the Lord his God. We saw Rehoboam, he became evil. Didn't, he, did, he had no preparation. Jotham became mighty because he had preparation. I encourage our youth, what are you preparing yourself for? There is more than just where you're standing today. There's a path that you're going to travel. Lift your eyes up off your feet and look down the path you're walking. Where is that path going in your life? 
Where will it take you? Will you be pleased when you get there? Will your parents be pleased when you get there? Will your church be pleased? Will your God be pleased? Because we, we so many times have people that show up where they are and they're in misery and they didn't even realize they were on a path leading to this misery. Oh, that our youth would look down the path to see the fruit of your path. And if you don't like what you see, then change paths. Get on the path of God. May you prepare to, to, to be used of God. I come back now to Second Chronicles chapter 5. In verse 11 of 2 Chronicles chapter 5, the scripture says, And it came to pass, when the priests were come out of the holy place, and then it puts in parentheses this statement, For all the priests that were present were sanctified, and did, then, did not then wait by course. Now it said this, and I've got it underlined in my Bible, All the priests that were present. Does it have a ring to you that maybe there were some priests that were not present? But all that were got something from God. I wonder how many people have prayed to God, God, I need help, God, I need guidance, God, I need whatever the, the need be. And God say, okay, I'm going to take care of this. And he gives the message to the man of God that would have helped. But they didn't get to the house of God, and all of a sudden they're still sitting at the house and time comes and goes and they're now mad at God because God didn't help. If they could just hear, hear God say, if you'd have just been in the house of God. 60 years God's given this place. 60 years God has offered direction for the people of this area. 60 years, what a testimony that is. I've had some people say, well, you know, preacher, I've, I can meet God just about anywhere. I've heard some say, I, I, I seem to feel closer to God in my bass boat. I had somebody say that to me than I do in church. First off, would you let me say something on that topic? Shame on any church that the presence of God is more felt in a bass boat than in the house of God. Shame on any church. Maybe that may not be a testimony of this one. I've had some guy say to me, he said, you know, preacher, he said, I can sense God more clearly up in my tree stand while I'm out hunting for a deer. He said, I pray more clearly. And I remember what I said to him. I said, yeah, on that cold morning, I know what you're praying. God, would you send the biggest buck by my path? My toes are freezing. Would you make it quick? <laughs> yeah, I, I can see. Yeah, you're praying. I've had some people say we don't even need to be a member of a church. Look with me over into the book of Revelation, chapter, chapter 1, and I go to verse 20. Revelation chapter 1, and I'm looking into verse 20. The God has given a miracle to North Highlands in this church. And in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 20, we see that Jesus Christ comes onto this isle called the Isle of Patmos. John the Baptist is there, he's in exile, and John the Baptist now is encountered by Jesus Christ. And when he's encountered, you see it in verse, t in verse 12, John says, I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. Now keep in mind, what did he turn to see? He turned to see who was talking to him, and when he turned, he saw not a who, but a what. Notice down into verse 20, it says this, the mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And the candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. Now when he said there in verse 20, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, that word angel is meaning messenger and it would reference the man of God for your church. Now somebody may be here today and say, well now you don't know Brother Rogers like we know him. He is anything but an angel. Oh no, I'm joking. <laughs> but God said, he said it this way, he said, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And if you look where those stars reside, they're in the right hand of God. In other words, somebody says, oh, I'm going to attack the preacher. 
you're attacking the hand of God that holds the preacher. It would be better to pray for the preacher if he's not in the right, because when he's not in the right, he's in the right hand of God. All it would take would be a mere flinch of the hand of God, and he would have the man of God's attention. But it said the candlestick was the seven churches. Now keep in mind, back up in verse 12, John turned, he heard a voice. And when he turned, he saw the, seven, the, the, golden, the candlesticks, the churches. In other words, the voice of God should be thundering out of, of churches all around the world. The voice of God. That's what this church has been about. That's what God's intent has been. For 60 years, I've been looking at that. I love that banner. For 60 years, the voice of God thundering from this church literally around the world through this thing called missions. I come to Matthew chapter 5, and you'll remember the story. In Matthew chapter 5, there was a question that was posed. He speaks of, in verse 14, he speaks of the light of the world and a city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. And in verse 15, he said this. He said, neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel. Where do they put it? He said, well, they put it in a candlestick. And then he says, and it giveth light to all that are in the house. God says that a candle doesn't just belong out here just who knows where. He said, but a candle belongs in a candlestick. If you've got a candle and it's lit, there it sits burning and you're holding it. If you just lay it down, you've got a disaster. If you were to put that candle not in the candlestick where it's safe and where the, the flame is protected, but if you just set it down, lay it down anywhere, be careless with it, you may burn something down and destroy things. But a candle in a candlestick, oh, now that works very good. A candle in a candlestick gives you the hint there may be other candles in it. With there being under ca other candles, one candle puts out a good light, but many candles put out a brighter light. And here we find that the candle does not belong in the can uh, uh, out by itself or under a bushel, but it belongs in the candlestick. Remember Ro uh, Revelation chapter 1 and verse 20? The picture of the candlestick was a picture of the local church. When you've got a person that's saved... Here I am, I'm standing here. Before I get saved, I'm, I'm, I'm a, it's, the picture would be I'm a candle without a light. But on the day of salvation, the light of the world, Jesus Christ, touches his flame to my wick and now I've got a light flickering on top. And all of a sudden, the individual being pictured by a candle, now we have the light of the world that came from Jesus Christ. And he says, we do not need to be there all alone, but we need to be placed in a candlestick, a local church. We need to be placed. Do you remember there was a woman in Luke chapter 16 that lost a coin? And do you remember that she went and got a candlestick and she thrust it into all the dark crevices looking for her coin? We've got a candlestick filled with candles, saved people with the light of the world, Jesus Christ, burning on our wick. And God says that I have come to this world to seek and to save those that are lost. And he uses this church now for 60 years as one of his methods of taking the candlestick and shining the gospel light literally around the world, seeking those that are lost. The importance of a church. I come back to 2 Chronicles chapter 5. Satan now in his method would say, well, if I can't stop the church from gathering, you know, verse 11 said, all that were present were sanctified. All that came to church got something. Well, then another thing he would do would be to try to stir disunity within the church. I notice in verse 13, he makes this statement. He said, it came to pass as the trumpeters and singers were as one. Did you ever hear a band, and I'm not making light of any, any, uh, any age bracket of musician, but did you ever hear some musicians that are real little and they try to play and they're playing individually, though there may be a bunch of them in the group. 
And when you get a bunch of them in a group and they play individually, they're concentrating all they can concentrate to make sure they hit the right note and they don't always hit the right note even they're trying real hard. But now you've got this one trying real hard and over here you've got this one trying real hard and concentrating and trying and over here you've got this one. Now there is something that would bring that group down to playing the same and playing in unity. That's called a conductor. But when you've got a musician that's just barely a musician, they're so concentrating on their music and they're so concentrating on their instrument that they, they're almost afraid to look away to see if they're doing it. And so all of a sudden, instead of one orchestra, you may have as many different instrumentalists as they're in that orchestra, you may have that many. And it gets ugly sounding. Now, I know, if that's your little Johnny in the orchestra, it's the most beautiful thing you've ever heard, and I understand that. But do you catch the picture? See, if Satan could get us, however many are here today, he would get us to take our, off, take our eyes off of God and try to just march to our own drumbeat. And all of a sudden, we'd all be marching to our own beat and making step. And if we, were, if we were in the Marines, then all of a sudden, we would be one that's out of step with everybody else. And that'll trip everybody up. If we're in the orchestra, we would be the one that's playing a solo while everybody else stopped because we're just doing our own thing. Unity in the house of God is vital. Amen. Unity. In the house of God. Look with me over in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. In 1 Corinthians chapter 8, we've got the Apostle Paul, and I'll lay the groundwork of this chapter, what's transpiring. The Apostle Paul has come together, and there are some in the church, or in this body of believers of the Corinthians, and some of them are new Christians. Some of them came from came from uh, worshiping in such a fashion that they would bring a sacrifice uh, of some kind of an animal. And part of their worshiping is, is they would eat the meat off the false god. Some of their worship to the god, to their false god. And so now they've gotten saved. From that and now they're over here trying to learn and be in the house of God and Paul acknowledges it he says uh, he says basically this in verse 4 he said as concerning for the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice to idols we know that an idol is nothing in the world and that there is none other God but one and what Paul basically said was for those that are more mature in the faith we understand it's all right. If that meat was offered on that idol, it's all right if we eat it. But there's some new Christians in the body of believers that they don't understand that. And they still think that if you were to eat that meat, you're worshiping a false god. You know, I've heard some preachers preach in such a capacity that they would almost look at somebody like that and say, listen, it's, pal it's time for you to grow up. And they would almost ridicule and almost put them under their foot and grind them. What's wrong with you? Don't you know your Bible? That's not how God deals with it. God says in verse 13, the apostle Paul uh, was used of God in this capacity. He said, wherefore, in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 13, if meat make my brother to offend, Paul said this, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth lest I make my brother to offend. We're talking about unity in the, in the house of God. Paul said there's not a thing wrong with eating that meat. But we got some newly saved Christians in here and they came out of that and it would be a stumbling block, Paul says, if I eat that meat in their presence because they haven't learned yet. And so Paul, instead of grinding on them, said, I will not eat that meat, though nothing's wrong with it because I don't want to trip them up. It was in Bismarck, North Dakota, pastored there for several years. And we as a family love rodeos. And so we went to the rodeo. Oh, our children were all so young. And our little boys with their straw cowboy hats, and we got a picture of them sitting there looking through the fence like, they couldn't believe anybody was fool enough to climb on the back of that bull. 
And they were just looking like they just couldn't believe their eyes. Man, we had such a wonderful time at that rodeo. We came to church. One of the women of the church heard that we'd gone to the rodeo. She said she didn't believe that was right. Now you've got to understand, before she got saved, she went to the rodeo chasing the cowboys. And so it was an attachment back to a wicked time of her life. And so all of a sudden, now here we are, and she's saying it offends her that we go to the rodeo. What'd you do, preacher? Did you put her in her place? No. We never went to another rodeo in Bismarck, North Dakota. Now, when we went to South Dakota, we went to the rodeo, but we didn't do it in North Dakota. We didn't want to be an offense. We didn't want to be a stumbling block. Do you understand if a church has unity, guard it? If a church does not have unity, pray for it, work toward it. But let's get this one point down. What did Paul say in verse 13? He said, wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend I. Now, who's the I? That's the guy that knows there's nothing wrong with it. In other words, unity sets in the hands of the people who have the knowledge. It's not, I've got the knowledge, I know there's nothing wrong. They need to get the knowledge and we'll have unity when they get there. That's not the way it is. Paul said, I who has the knowledge will not do anything to be a stumbling block to those who do not. Unity sets in the hands of those who have the knowledge. Yet, that's why he had to say early on, he said in verse 1, now as touching things offered unto, them, unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Catch this next phrase, knowledge puffeth up. Paul's trying to tell us, yes, we've got to grow in knowledge, but if we're not careful, we'll get proud about how much we know. And we'll look down our nose at those who do not know what we know. And when that attitude starts, disunity will come to the house of God. Come back with me to 2 Chronicles chapter 5 and I'll be done. Let me point this out. What he's talked about in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, remember the house of God, we saw it in chapter 6, it's about the name of God. The house of God is about the presence of God, it's about the worship of God, it's about the praise of God. And yet we come to verse 11 and we talked about the importance of being in church. Then we looked in verse 13. We talked about unity and the importance of unity. Now notice what happened in verse 13 as well. When, when people got to church, when unity came to church, notice what they began to do. They began to lift up their voice in verse 13 with the trumpets and cymbals and instruments and music. And what did they do? They praised God. They didn't talk about, it wasn't about yesterday's football game. It wasn't about our team won in basketball. It was about God when they got to church. Then when you notice this, they got to church, there was unity at church, they began to praise God. They said this, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Now, so okay, so we've, we got to church, we've got unity, now we're worshiping and praising our God. What happened next? The scripture says that then... When? Once they got there, once they got unified, once they began praising that then. The house was filled with a cloud, even the house of the Lord, so that the priests could not stand to minister by reason of the cloud. Why is that? For the glory of the Lord had filled the house of God. Now, church, let me make a few statements. I'm going to close my Bible. I'm done. But we have raised a generation of church-going people that, are, that do not really understand what it is to speak of the glory of the Lord filling the house of God. We've learned how to come to church and sing the same old hymns. I've heard them say that. That's what I sing, and I love them. But I've heard people say, it's just the same old hymns, it's just the this, it's just the that. And we have raised a generation that comes to church that knows not what it's missing when the presence of God does not fill the house of God. 
That's why you would find the children of Israel, the old timers, weeping over missing something and the new timers excited about what they have. Folks, we got God and this is his house. It's this portion of his house has been here 60 years. I wonder if we could go back 60 years and bring back some of those that were in this church 60 years ago. Would they be happy with what they see? I'm not slapping. I promise you I'm not slapping. But I know this, as a nation, we've been taking small steps that are getting larger away from God as a nation, and the churches are doing the exact same thing. I wonder how much of the presence of God they could feel way back then in this church. That somehow today, is it possible this church doesn't have what they used to have and yet doesn't recognize it. Oh, I hope that's not the case. Church, let's do this. Let's not put God in a box. But let's just let him tell us what it takes for him to fill our church with his presence. More unity more faithfulness and attendance Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Let's go for God being pleased. Let's bow our heads.